you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna waste a little time until Josh gets up here because that's actually one of my special skills. So, thanks everybody for turning out today. Uh, great to have you here. Um, my name's Dave Rural. I am. Uh, the founder, owner, and in general, most of Mobile Game Doctor, Mobile Game Design Consultancy. Josh, you want to introduce yourself? My name is Josh. I uh, run Eastside Games. Uh, so we're, uh, I don't know what you call it now. I've heard everything from Triple I Studios, which I don't really like, to I guess we're an independent studio. We're based in Vancouver. We have uh, around 80 people. We uh, launched a bunch of indie hits years ago have about 25 million installs which we paid for most we didn't pay for most of them and uh, we just launched trailer park boys awesome you. so you know let me ask you the question I asked you the first time I heard about the project which is the trailer what <laughs> um, seriously it's it's a, a pretty niche license now you may not realize this because you're Canadian but just letting you know right um, it's not Star Wars, it's not Star Trek, it's not one of the huge blockbuster licenses we re usually see out there. Why did you decide to do a Trailer Park Boys game to begin with? So I just think from our back catalog and being independent and not having a lot of money in the bank, the one challenge we had with doing IP was finding someone that didn't want a huge upfront payment. And we're also just huge Trailer Park Boys fans. If you haven't watched Trailer Park Boys, it's hilarious. You'll either get it or you won't get it. I mean, I'm a country <laughs> kid. I grew up in a trailer. So it's... It just seems normal for me, but it's like a mockumentary of these guys doing crazy scams like uh, stealing wieners and reselling them from the grocery store to uh, opening up bars, opening up gyms in the trailer park, and just all sorts of these zany schemes. Uh, it just felt like it was something that would really resonate within our culture, and uh, 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 I, I know it's catching on, and with Netflix and it getting new seasons, we thought it could be an IP that we could do uh, justice. and. Uh, and fuck it, why not? Just, just <laughs> do something fun, right? That's that's the east side spirit right there. Um, so usually the reason that you want to work with license to begin with, you get kind of a built-in audience, some automatic downloads, some leverage on user acquisition prices, right? Um, so that's one of the reasons you want to be super broad if you can. How's it worked out working with this, you know, less known property that you're able to license? How much of the fan base has come from the existing TPB fan base? How many is it the first exposure to the brand? Are you seeing a lot of differences on cost of acquisition for that? Yeah, so there's a couple things there, especially if you're gonna if you're thinking about doing a game that's uh, licensed IP and you've never done it before. Is uh, there's lots of data out there that you can do things like Facebook ad spends and uh, dig into that before you start negotiating. So that's really good to have that IP data that you can actually see um, kind of what the bite is on the IP uh, for. Uh, buying users, which you know we can't compete with uh, the top charts. And to back up a bit, a little bit of the success of Trailer Park Boys was it was in uh, we launched it. We were a top 100 game in 100 countries. Uh, we were the top uh, app and uh, top 10 monetizing app in uh, Canada uh, over the weekend. Uh, and then in the U.S., we were a top 20. Mm -hmm. uh, and games. So that was like huge for us being an independent to be able to hit that. And part of that is the IP. So what an IP is going to give you is it's going to give you a really big bump um, from people that love that IP to push it up. And then what you have to try to do is you have to try to capitalize on that and um, ride that wave and push it forward. The other thing that it gives you is it gives you a uh, a voice when you go to talk to the platforms because the platforms have always had traditional content on before long before they had games games and uh, our uh, content like movies TV shows music they've all been on the platforms well before they even thought there were games so they have great relationships so you can leverage whoever puts that content on the uh, app stores uh, to uh, give connections to you to be able to maybe get some of those free installs Nice. So, in terms of the current player base, though, are you seeing a lot of non-TB non-TPB fans, a lot of folks that are getting their first brand exposure there, or are you mostly playing to the fan community? Uh, I think I think it's we thought it would be all 
hardcore Trailer Park Boys fans, but we're actually finding a lot of people that did, don't even know it's a TV show. So you're going to leverage both, uh, uh, and you're not really going to know until you launch, but we actually find probably about 25% of the people that play it have watched the TV show before are considered like hardcore fans. Some might just be casual watchers, and then the rest of the people, what we try to do is try to loop them back around in that content. So we try to think of it as... Uh, Scott did a really good article today on fiber. You should um, check it out. That We talk more about making games now is just about it's one piece. You have to just make content as well as games. So you have to be able to put out your streams. You have to have your community team always talking to your players. So it's more content. So we're seeing it as a, a, an advantage of independent studios that you can put out a game. They play the game. They run out of stuff to do in the game. They go out and they watch some episodes of Trailer Park Boys. Uh, they come back uh, and maybe they play the game again, but it's like an endless loop, so they really get into it to become a super fan of the IP. Nice. Um, well, so that's what I tell them right before I'm going to give them their check. So there that, that's you the go. pitch. <laughs> Here are your new super fans. You know, that whole thing about like 25% are hardcore fans and a lot are casually acquainted. It's the same thing for the Star Wars games. Yep. I bet you didn't know that. No. Okay. Never heard of the Star Wars before. <laughs> See? And now he's playing. Um, so. Um, shifting gears a little bit, in the blurb you mentioned that you had been close to canceling this project twice. How did that happen? It, it sounds like it wasn't the smoothest development. What was the, the story of the game and its journey to market? For this project, we were, it was probably the most uh, we've ever been over budget and over time budget and monetary budget that I've ever done in my career. Uh, and uh, I didn't get fired. So it's, <laughs> luckily it worked out. But with this, we were, uh, I think it's uh, $600,000 in eight months over budget. Um, so at the midpoint, we looked at the game and do you remember like the the weird mechanic we had with like siphoning gas and like the mini games and all yeah, that? Yeah, as, as a little bit of background, I, I worked with Josh on the project for a little bit over a year. Uh, they showed me the first build in March of 2016, and it was literally unplayable. <laughs> um, it was just <laughs> you've seen you've seen trash fires before. I've, I've seen better trash fires. Actually. It's like a trailer. It's like a, a trash fire in a trailer park. That's what it was. <laughs> a trailer park. Ricky lit shit on fire. There. And so, like, lesson one is, if you're going to do licensed IP and you're a super fan of it, don't trust that you're going to make a good game because you're going to get so caught up in building something that you want to play versus what maybe is fun or will make money because now you're entering a business relationship with this IP they want to make money on this as well so you have to really make sure it's all aligned so what we did is essentially restructured the team and uh, I showed this to Dave and uh, his body language when he looked at it wasn't good <laughs> and then he he basically said um, you know I think I can help you on this I, I have some openings uh, to do some consulting on it. So we basically scrapped it and went back and, and we had some art created and stuff like that and we went back to the drawing board. But I think going forward, when you get a certain size or when you're around for a certain time as an independent game developer, you kind of need to bring in somebody from the outside that is okay with saying like, your ideas suck because like everyone on our team, um, we're so good at being fans and like not killing our games that we're just like riding it out. Like I could have still probably been making Trailer Park Boys until they're like, dude, you need to launch the game. Like, oh, come on. <laughs> nice. So um, the game, one of the things that you've seen in a lot of press about the game, or at least that I've seen, is sort of how well the mechanics kind of fit the IP. Right, not just the narrative, but actually the way the game plays. Was that a big focus for you guys? Was that something that emerged organically? It was, we, we kind of stumbled upon it, but we, at the point where, I'm sure a lot of people that make games get to this, where you get kind of fatigued with the game, you're not really sure um, if it's fun or not. But the one thing that we wanted to do, like, now that we look back at it, it was the stupidest thing ever, but we loved the Trailer Park Boys and we loved the IP, but we hired a writer to come in and write new jokes about the Trailer Park Boys. But 
the whole thing about the show is you already like the joke, so why are you rewriting it? It was like such a dumb thing to do. So what we did is went back to the drawing board and just let's relive the seasons, the old seasons that people haven't watched in 15 years, and they still remember them and they think about how cool those moments were. And of course it's cool because it was like, 15 years ago, you everyone here was a lot cooler 15 years ago. I can pretty much vouch for anyone that I know in this room. So we went back and we just relived all of those uh, moments. And then we decided to make, uh, you know, uh, we decided strategically as a team to be like, let's do something a little different as an idle game. Uh, Dave uh, and the design team came up with, uh, let's do seasons based on the Trailer Park Boys seasons. And let's do a uh, narrative linear game uh, where everyone would kind of have the same experience, which not many people have done that in the idle game yet. So it'll be like, you know, at least then if we fail, we failed and we did something different. Yeah, absolutely. And there are a lot of differences, I think, in terms of how the game plays, right? So the seasons and the goals, I think, worked well, gave it shape, worked nicely with the narrative of the boys constantly going to jail, coming back and doing dumb stuff. Um, one of the things that sort of uh, came out of some internal ESG discussions was the decision to really try and go with some innovative monetization, get rid of the ascension currency, do the kind of gotcha system for the cards and the secondary currency, um, and just disregard the way that idle games are typically monetized in the past. Success? Fail? Something in the middle? How's it worked out? Uh, it's actually been a success, so it's ple it's a pleasant success because we were kind of accounting on uh, we're counting on it being a kind of a 50-50 split or 60-40 split between making the majority of your money or a little less than half your money on ads. Uh, but instead, we we made sure we kind of baked the ad flow into the game, and an ad was a value was value onto was a value add-on versus it was the core monetization. And so what we're actually seeing in the game right now is we're seeing 80-20, uh, 75-25 on in-app purchases versus ads. And because of that, we're able to push new things like uh, live events, uh, that sort of thing. Um, and we were just counting on count, talking to friends that made idle games, uh, like the ad cap guys, and they they were like, bank on ads, ads are going to be big, and ads are still a big part of our monetization, but uh, pleasant. It, it's a lot easier to, to manage IAP because you can directly manage the inventory, you can manage uh, you know, sales, promos, you can link those directly up. You know they're always going to be available. With ads, you have the unknown of, in a certain territory, they might not be available. So most of your successful games up to this point have had a certain branding. Uh, You've got a little mascot, you know, he's got leaves that sort of go out in various directions, right? Uh, whenever I tell people I'm working with these side games, they say who, I say the pot farm guys, they go, oh, right. <laughs> um, so I think this is really the first thing you put out there that's, that's charted, that's been a real success, um, that hasn't been weed branded. Um, two questions about that. Number one, how is the experience of working without the weed brand been different from working with it? And number two, what does this portend for your strategy going forward? It's, it's killed all my good jokes at networking. I used to be able to say, like, <laughs> if you bought virtual weed, you bought it from me. But no, I can say if you've ever stayed in a well, virtual the, trailer park, you probably got it from me. So. There you go. They're buying virtual liquor. It's good. That's it's okay, good. yeah. It, it's been good. It's... Um, you know, we got, we've been able to, we're kind of rebranding the studio now. We're, we're looking at licensed IP, but also making original IP games. Uh, our Dragon Up game just came back from Casual Connect uh, Singapore, and it won uh, Audience, Audience Award. Nice. Best in show. Best awesome. in show. Uh, thank you. Uh, so that's good. Uh, we have a bunch of things that we're jamming out that I think are going to be really fun. Uh, I think it's also changed with doing an idle game. We've really focused on what we want to build as a studio, and I think there's a big area that's underserved. So uh, we kind of make the game that people don't identify their gamers, but they play a game. So Trailer Park Boys will be, just like Pot Farm was the first farming game that dudes play, or that you want to say that you play a farming game. <laughs> uh, and. Trailer Park Boys is uh, a truly one-handed 
uh, game that you can play. A lot of games, even really casual games like match three, you have to play with two hands. So it's super casual, uh, constant progression. And it's the type of game that people will only maybe have that game on their phone or something else. Uh, so a lot of times our fans are people like, I don't play games, but I play Trailer Park Boys. So we really just thought there was a audience for that. And we're building our next two or three games to be one-handed, quick to play, quick to pick up, and uh, always progressing uh, and uh, have a really good storyline to them. So I'll ask you one more quick question and then we'll throw it open to the audience for the last couple of minutes. But uh, I think you guys have self-published every single title you've done, right? You've owned all that risk uh, on the development side, owned all the, the distribution, the marketing. Feel good about that? Ever been some perilous moments? Uh, is it a decision you'd make again? Except one. We decided to go with, do you remember like Six Waves, LOL? We, oh, we were one of the people that got picked up to do that. and. Um, I, they pretty much fired us as a client, so <laughs> we were done. We, we left ways, but we were going to publish like a romance. It was like a romance adventure game called Ruby Skies. That was a little trivia for you oh, there. Oh, wow. We did that. That's another reality. <laughs> yeah. We, I don't know. Happy self-publishers? Uh, self-publishing has been good? great. Uh, it's, uh, uh, I, I think a lot of people are, I, are scared about doing self-publishing, but I think you just got to start small. Uh, you got to get stuff out and iterate on it. So we're not entirely masters of it, but in doing the games we have over the years, we now, you know, Trailer Park Boys had its first 2 million installs in its first 30 days. It had in its next 15 days uh, another 500,000 installs. Um, we're still growing. We're trying to hit 10 million installs in year one by still being profitable. Uh, and uh, I think we'll hit it. But you have to start small. You have to just start getting content out and building on it. So the biggest thing with that was we had to launch working with licensed IP. And the timelines we were up against, we had to launch Trailer Park Boys without big things in it like live events. So mm -hmm. essentially what you're going to see, we're launching a big live event on Friday. So uh, on it's iOS exclusive. Uh, and Things like that should kind of be, it's kind of pounded in you if you work with a publisher, have to be done on day one. But if we had to wait those extra 90 days without those um, 2 million installs that now we can get all that data from, uh, we would be so behind, I don't know if we'd be able to catch up. So being yep. self-published, we can actually make really good choices based on that, staff up, um, get whatever providers you need, renegotiate with ad networks, that sort of stuff. So we have a, a little time left for a question or two from the audience, and it looks like we have a question. Yeah, I got one question. Um, I was curious, like... Microphone. Oh, thanks. So naturally, there's like a whole host of, you know, constraints and challenges in working with one IP, but what's interesting with Trailer Park Boys is that it's recently launched on Netflix, so I was just curious if you could speak to any additional challenges or constraints that has arisen by having to align yourself alongside Netflix's intentions uh, for that IP as well. For example, uh, Trailer Park Boys season, the newest season launched slightly before the game came out, and that you know seemed like uh, unfortunate because I mean if you know if the game was already out and then the new season launched, obviously that would be like uh, it would contribute to that uptick a little bit. So I guess what has it been like in, in terms of coordinating alongside Netflix uh, while also uh, working with the boys? It's it. I don't think it's anything out of the normal for if you're going to work with IP, you got to kind of schedule. You have to kind of bake that into your schedule and add some padding because they're going to have certain times that um, they're going to want to line it up with when they do a launch or when they do something. It's no different than if you're working with, when you're on mobile games, uh, if Apple says, we're going to do a feature, but you have to have this content in in like a month, you just make it happen, right? So uh, you just kind of have to pad your schedule a little bit so you can you can align for all those things. But uh, they've been a really great IP to work with. It's been, it's been pretty easy across the board. Uh, can't really complain. I think we got a softball for our first IP because we talk directly to them. We don't talk through a bunch of layers of, of agents or uh, eight, 85 different VPs that sit around a table that I have to like pitch my idea to. All right. We're the boys in the chorus. We hope you like our show. We know you're rooting for us, but now we have to go. Thank you, Josh, for your insights, your candor. Thank you, everybody, for coming today. And uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you very much. And that's what a proper moderator does. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah.